Welcome to Paint with Alex. It's our third episode. I brought my slide whistle back because I love my slide whistle. Um, and there's actually some really cool uh, analogies that we could make and we will make uh, with painting and the slide whistle, okay? Because it's got its own limits. This is black and this is white. <laughs> And you, you got all these little variations in between. Um, we got an exciting show for you this week. We got uh, a pro tip power power move for the for the for the first just I don't know minute of the show, and uh, we're going to jump right into some painting. Uh, let's go over to this camera right here, and uh, what I want to show you real quick is if you joined me last week, then. Um, yeah, if you joined me last week, then you painted in oil, and you have likely uh, one of these, and it would be filled up to here with, uh, with Gamsol, or whatever your, your solvent is, and uh, you used it to clean your brushes throughout your painting session, and then, uh, uh, and then it's, you got a bunch of dirty, sort of gray, ugly colored stuff in there and you're probably wondering what do I do with that you know uh, dealing with the solvents is definitely one of the things that makes people afraid of oil painting uh, I think people are less afraid ooh, of acrylic because you just water it's just water you have a big bucket of water you don't have to get turpentine or mineral spirits or anything. It's just water, and then you clean your brush of all these toxic chemicals in this bucket of water, and then suddenly, magically, you just seem to pour it down the drain and not worried about it anymore. Oil paint's different. You got these, uh, you know, these are chemicals. There's in the pigments, not in the, in the oil paint, uh, in the linseed oil. But uh, you're gonna end up with this stuff, and you do not pour this down the drain, okay? This does not go down the drain, but you don't have to waste it, all right? I remember for a while on the can, they used to tell you how to reuse it, but then I think they figured, well, why are we telling them how to use less of our product? Um, so now they don't show you how to reuse the Gamsol, but we're gonna show you that right off the bat, pro tip, and then we're just gonna jump into uh, what we're gonna do today. And learning to deal with this will help you become more friends with oil paint. We got the gloves on. So now how do you reuse the, uh, this solvent that's inside this uh, cleaner here? Well, get yourself a pickle jar, okay? Or some kind of a jar of spaghetti sauce or something, okay? And that's gonna be your designated dregs container right here. So uh, I'm going to open this up and I about a week ago poured my dregs from inside here. I poured the dregs into my pickle jar and I'll show you magically what happens is uh, you can pour off, you'll see, perfectly clean turpentine right there. Look at that. That's about half of what I need to refill up my Gamsol. The thing that happens is when you pour the dirty muck inside this thing right here, inside the pickle jar, uh, it sinks because it's heavy. And it'll sink to the bottom and it'll leave a clean layer at the top that you can pour off into another container right here, which I've done, okay? Now, I'm gonna take the top off of my Brush, brush cleaner right here, and um, I'm gonna take this little sucker out of here. It might be harder than I think, actually. Uh, if that happens, what you're gonna wanna do, someone get me a, like a, some pliers real quick, Nolan? Yeah. Um, as you can see, I have like a really old uh, brush cleaner here, and it gets a little bit stuck with the pliers. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the little uh, thing out of the bottom of this, which is inside. I'll show you how it works. 
and then I'm going to just stir up all of this dirty dregs and pour all the dirty dregs into my pickle jar. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to grab this. And it comes out with a little bit of effort, uh, but you can see what that looks like. And I'm just going to take a brush here and just mix it all up. doesn't even matter. And it's just going to look like gray glop, uh, kind of syrupy or whatever. And just pour all that right into your pickle jar. And you can just take a, a little bit of a paper towel, maybe wipe out the inside of this container here. And then you can put this sucker right back inside. Yeah. And here's the stuff that we saved over from last week. We can pour that in. And like I said, it filled it up about halfway. And then I only need a few more ounces of this Gamsol. And I am topped off and ready to go. Uh, why is that awesome? A, you're saving materials and you're reusing stuff, uh, which is always a good move these days. And, you know, painters, you got to learn to be frugal and save your money. Um, and that's, uh, so reusing your Gamsol is a great way to do that. Secondly, it, uh, it's good for the environment because you're not just going to throw all of this into the trash or whatever. It's perfectly good. You know, you, um, it's kind of like motor oil. They, they, uh, they can reuse that. So, um, so then what you end up doing when your pickle jar is just completely filled with uh, gray slime, I mean, I guess you could turn that back into paint and, and use it as paint again. But I just, what I do is I take it to a place where you get batteries recycled or where they deal with uh, toxic chemicals. There's usually every city's got one in the bad part of town or something. And, um, and you can just leave them your jar of stuff and tell them it's paint waste and, and uh, they properly dispose of it which is what we want to try to do as stewards of the earth. Um, you know, last week we did this adorable little uh, kitten painting. And um, we started that, I think we could even do it like that, top down. Uh, we started the cat painting off here with, um, with uh, by mixing up our, uh, the beginning of a grayscale. And you can see that I've got this grayscale right here on the side. We have three values here, three values. And we're going to mix two more, and then we're going to do a real quick lay-in of, uh, of this Washington Crossing the Delaware painting. Let's go back to the slides. And let me see, we got next. There, OK, that is what we're going to copy. And that's why I was playing Yankee Doodle on the slide whistle. Uh, that's a beautiful painting. God, I wish I could remember that guy's name. I'm embarrassed. Uh, German painter, but he painted this classic American scene. And uh, we're in revolutionary times, so we thought this would be a really neat painting to uh, bite our teeth into. Uh, we're going to be using exactly the same thought process as what went into doing our kitten painting. Um, but we're going to paint kittens crossing the Delaware. How about that? That's even better than Washington crossing the Delaware. We're going to paint kittens crossing the Delaware. You can see I love this painting. I've painted it more than a few times. Here's one version, uh, uh, kind of like a, an expressionistic take of that sucker. Uh, we, got a, we got an even crazier version of it right here. Boom, bizarre, what is going on there? Uh, but I love doing master copies and they're such a great way to learn. Um, and believe me, every painter that you admire has done master copies. Um, if we go through, let me, let me blast through a few of these slides here and then we'll, we'll backtrack a little. Um, you know, there's the two colors that we're starting to deal with, white and black. And then last week we talked about the first half tone, middle, gray, magic, middle. That is the next most important value that you can get, to get your mind around. Uh, if you split another half tone in between those two, you end up with something that looks like this. And you get five values from white to middle gray to black with two half tones in between. Five values. That is more than anybody needs to start any painting. 
And I know that it gets complicated, but, um, uh, but working in black and white and with limited values is a really awesome way to, I could probably go to the, let me see if I can step on camera here. Oh, there we go. Um, is a really awesome way to, uh, you know, uh, tackle the, uh, the getting better at painting. So we can look at some of these old master slides here of uh, them working in black and white. Uh, there's uh, kind of more of a brown and white. That might end up being a little bit more like what we're working with, going to be working with today. Um, uh, here you can see uh, Peter Paul Rubens working with the limited colors. Uh, and these are, you know, I, uh, if, if they weren't how they started the painting, they were certainly done um, to a, a quite a level of, of finish. The, uh, there's an Ang, that's a famous uh, monochrome Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang. Uh, the, the, uh, the, there was sort of steps to, to how the, the, we evolve the image as people learning to create images, and you kind of want to go through that same art history in your own uh, journey through painting. Uh, now here's a beautiful little Degas, uh, just to get a little bit more contemporary. Uh, a, 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 a dark monochrome scene. You got a little patch of white and a lot of black and a little bit of gray. Um, and Degas loved to uh, do these monotypes, in mono, black and white monotypes, and then paint uh, pastels and colors on top of them. Big fan of that. Uh, and then we go all the way to, I was talking about how, uh, you know, painters that we admire have done master copies. Here's a, here's a, a Picasso doing a Velasquez. This is Las Meninas, and it's a really fascinating copy that he did. Just in straight black and white, I love it. You know, Guernica is in black and white. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the, the edification of doing a master copy, you could just go right, take yourself to Pasadena and go to the Norton Simon Museum. There is a Degas there that is an incredible copy of uh, a painting by Oh, I don't have the artist. I thought it was, uh, it's a, an incredible copy of a painting by uh, Poussin, who is so perfect. There's another uh, black and white uh, Picasso. There's power in black and white. You know, it's like that quote that Matisse said, the great colorist makes themselves known even in the simplest charcoal drawing. How can a colorist make themselves known in black and white? Well, they can because they understand what's going on and it's kind of what I'm trying to get across to you guys as we journey through this. I can't obviously get everything across in one hour, but uh, that's why we have multiple episodes. Uh, now we're gonna go back to, there we go, there's Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, the first thing, whenever I uh, think about composition, I break it down into two elements and I've said it before and you'll hear me say it again. And, those two elements are the line, no, start with the line and the color, okay? Um, the line oftentimes tells you where the colors are going. We draw a line to define certain things that maybe don't exist. We tend to draw lines wherever there's a contrast change or a texture change. We draw lines where a form ends or where another form begins. Um, uh, and there's obviously a very profound linear arrangement to the uh, Washington Crossing the Delaware composition. It's a classic triangle, certainly, the triangular pyramid composition. Um, and, oh yeah, there we go. But how are we going to get that composition onto our canvas? We need a clue. And we need to have something in common between the image that we're going to copy and our canvas. And what that's called is squaring up. So we're going to do a super simple squaring up. If you go back to the slide image, you'll see that right through the middle there is a crosshair. There is a vertical line and a horizontal line that bisect the center of this painting. And we are going to do that right now. Let's go back to the canvas. I got a quick ruler here. And we're just going to draw a line right down the center here. Maybe you can't see it, but I can see it. 
might be, might be not quite visible to you, but it's visible to me and that's all that matters. And we're gonna draw another line right down the middle here. Gonna go this way. And so now, my canvas has one thing in common with what I'm gonna copy. Only one thing. That one thing is the crosshair. But that's all I need to help me start to put paint where I want it to go. Because now I've divided the image into smaller regions and I've divided the canvas into similar smaller regions and we can just blast. We can blast ahead once we've done that simple move. You know, sometimes you see people and they square up and they think for some reason it needs to be squares or they need to be really small squares. Uh, I'm always of the belief that you should square up with the biggest squares that you can get away with. Here we're only going to divide it up into four. And that to me is going to be more than enough to generally place and block in the image that we're going to try to tackle today. So that's how we're going to deal with the line. Now just when I, when I say the line, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to draw lines. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so keep that in mind because there's also such a thing as you know painting with color and drawing with shapes as opposed to just lines alone so how are we going to deal with that well we are going to mix some paint here let's start with that uh, if we go let me go to the slides uh, oh no no we'll, we'll just go go st we'll stay at the top down camera here i'm going to squeeze out a bunch of white and then I got a bunch of free paint, um, which I always recommend that if someone is giving away old tubes of paint, take them up on the offer. There is so much free art supplies out there. So many people start and stop painting. If you're clever or if you know some people or if you're on Craigslist, you're always going to be able to find art supplies. I found some raw umber here. And I'm going to squeeze out some raw umber, a nice good size chunk of that stuff right there and that's going to be my dark well actually I'm going to squeeze out just a little bit of ultramarine blue as you can see here about that much not a significantly less ultramarine blue than the raw umber because I want to make kind of a warm a warm black here and uh, let me um, so that we're, we're, our monochrome isn't going to be a gray black. It's going to be more of a brown black. All right. Uh, and I'm going to take my brush here and I'm just going to mix those colors together just like that. Stir, stir, stir. Mix them up. You know, if you want, if your pile starts to get a little bit big, you can kind of scrape it up with your palette knife like that and stir it around again. And uh, if you're wearing gloves like I do, you can just squeegee out that paint right out of the brush and you get a nice good sized glob out. And now I got a pretty clean, we got a pretty clean pile of, of, uh, of the burnt, uh, of this sort of a black that we're going to mix. Now uh, with any color that I want to learn something about the color, no matter what, whether I mixed it or whatever, um, I want there, there's two ways that a paint exists, honestly, and that's as a wash or opaque. Uh, I, I don't know how, um, how else it can exist otherwise, <laughs> uh, but as a wash, it's always instructive to look at what the paint looks like as a wash. Here's kind of a, uh, maybe a, a middle grayish patch of just that pure color uh, as, as a wash that I just laid on my canvas transparently. And if I wanted to find out exactly what value that was, um, I could. I've got my little handy grayscale here around all the time. It's a little bit lighter than middle gray. Uh, and then the other informative thing to learn about a color is to mix, to see it as a tint, all right? This isn't necessarily gonna be exactly middle gray. But this same color that I painted as a particular wash on the canvas, now I am taking that same color and I'm adding white to it. 
And I'm going to, you can see I need to add a lot of white to it. Uh, and I'm going to add enough white to this so that it matches the value of the wash. You understand? So now I'm putting on a tint of this same color right next to it. And the first thing you can see right off the bat is that the tint with white is always cooler than the wash. And with earth tones and grays and neutral, it's very significant, the shift that happens in the feeling of the color. Wash is always warmer than the tint of any, of the, any color that you've laid down as the wash, the same color. Um, so that's a little fact to know. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear people say when they've got a really high key painting, they'll criticize it by saying, oh, your colors look chalky. Usually what's happening when your colors look, quote, chalky, is you're not compensating for the fact that all that white makes the color cooler. Um, and so then all your tints look cold and people think your color looks chalky. But we're not dealing with color today, we're just dealing with monochrome. So now what are we going to do? We're going to very quickly now mix ourselves a hefty quantity of middle gray, magic middle. Um, and we're gonna make a we're gonna make sure we got plenty of juice here. And you can see I'm I'm getting an ample size uh, pile here. Again, if your pile starts getting out of control, spread about across the palette, that's where a palette knife is handy to move some colors around. So I've got I'm gonna test it right over here, and we've just about matched it. You can see as I put this right on, on the uh, grayscale that I've got next to it, it almost disappears, okay? It looks a little bit more green than the uh, grayscale. So now, middle. You see, all you gotta do is find it once and then remember. <laughs> and the, the best way to remember about a color is to paint a swatch of it and keep it around you at all times. Uh, but as I've said before, if you don't know what middle gray is, the closest thing around you is a paper bag. And that's going to be where you're going to find middle gray. Now we're going to mix a half tone, one half tone. And uh, since we've already got a bunch of this dark here, I'm going to mix it eh, right next to my pile. So I want to make sure that it's uh, darker than middle and lighter than dark. And I don't have to be too exact for what we're painting today. Um, but you could be as exact as you want and you could certainly paint the next two half tones on your grayscale so that you've got five. But what, we do, what we're looking for is we're looking for a value that feels halfway in between my middle and my dark here. So here you can see that this color I've mixed looks dark. Here you can see that that same color looks light. And so that's close enough. That would be a middle, middle gray value swatch. We could, we could just like, what we'll end up doing for our gray scale is uh, painting a big rectangle of that right in between our middle gray and our light, I mean our dark. Now, uh, my brush here has got a lot of, I've been mixing it with primarily with dark. And just because I have plenty of brushes to choose from, I'm going to have another brush right here that I'm going to use to mix towards my light. All right, so um, I'm going to grab, we can see on the top down here, I'm going to grab uh, a bunch of white. And I'm going to grab a little bit of this dark, just a little. And I'm going to mix a pile of paint that falls in between middle and light. And my white, OK? Uh, and I can test it right up here. I want it to fall in between the two. I want it to be darker than that and lighter than that. Maybe I got a little bit too light too fast. I'm going to add a little bit more dark to this. Um, 
it's always a matter of getting familiar with how much these pigments move each other around. Um, raw umber, which I'm using because I just got a bunch of free paint and we're not getting paid to do this show at the moment. Um, but uh, raw umber's weaker. It's weak. It's wimpy. It barely has a lot of strength um, to, to move color in any significant direction. Um, one more pro tip as I struggle to squeeze the last blobs out of, the, uh, out of this tube. Tube ringer, I think I brought this up last week, and I'm bringing it in this week. I'm going to put this little sucker in here, and you're going to just start doing this to your toothpaste and your anchovies and everything, man. Your moisturizers. Uh, squeeze that out. And I just want to make sure I got plenty of this dark that I mixed up here. Um, and we'll squeeze just a smidge of that ultramarine blue because I wanted it to just be a little bit cool. And we just mix that around. I have got a palette now that to me is going to have some stuff going on. I've got some opportunities here. And uh, you don't have to work the same size that I'm working. Um, and so then you don't have to squeeze out as much paint. But uh, we're squeezing out a good amount because we like it. Now, when we talked about the, the kitten painting last week, there was the kitten outside the window and everything outside that window, we were making sure to be mixing values that were above, middle, and white. And between those two, everything up in between here. And then indoors, with our kitten painting, we made sure to just mix all of our values down in this range. And I can tell you that as we go to the image that we're going to look at from the, on, on the slide, that is exactly how this painting is composed. This painting is just like this kitten painting. Uh, the background of Washington Cross in the Delaware is all values that are lighter than middle gray. Okay, Even things that seem dark, like these clouds right there, clouds. Um, and then everything in the foreground is darker than middle gray. Everything. His skin tone, this little white collar on his shirt, the yellow trousers, the light tan leather, the white stripes on the flag. Everything is darker than middle gray. It's a very simple composition in that regard. And so that's why we can make this leap from what seems really simple to something that seems oh my gosh, that's, that's way too complicated for me to tackle. But if we go to the top down and look at my palette here, here's middle gray. This is a tint that falls between middle and white. Here's middle gray. This is a tint that falls between middle and dark. All my background is going to be up in this area, and all my foreground is going to be over in this area. So let's go. Let's jump into it. We've squared up the canvas, so we know, generally speaking, where we're going to be putting some colors. And we got a palette that is ready. It is fecund. It is ripe for the harvesting of values. You know, um, you know what I think we could do before I start painting? How much time do we have? We got 30 minutes. I've been going on for 30 minutes. Let's really quickly read a little bit of the American crisis to give us the courage to work on this painting, all right? These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Ah! All right, well, we're not going to die doing this painting, much unlike these guys crossing in the boat. So let's do it. Here we go. 
but we're going to use some crazy brushes this time too. We've got, uh, we got these gigantic gonzo brushes that, uh, I can't even get them out of the little container here that I put them in to safely protect them. We're going to paint with these mostly. How about that? Just to make it simple for you guys, shaving brushes. You know, I, uh, I don't shave that much, but I paint with these. They're great. So we have two, and we'll use one for our lights and one for our darks. Uh, since we're starting this painting also, you're going to want to use a lot of medium, the fast drying medium. So I'm going to pour some of that medium you see on the top down right in this little cup here. And I'm going to make sure to just dip into that at ample times and use a copious quantity of that medium, which will help my paint dry fast. So let's start going here. I got my brush and I got my shaving brush. And uh, let's just start laying in some, some white. I see uh, kind of like right a little bit above that where the horizon is. Uh, or, or the, the center line. I, I see a really light sky and I see a couple of beams going over there. And now I'm gonna start to sneak in towards a little bit of my darker, darker values. I'm moving down into that second pile that I got there. And I'm gonna just start smashing this in. Second pile. I feel there's kind of a little mountain range that's kind of cutting through and it goes all the way across. You know, I'm not even worried about what's going to go on with Washington yet. Um, we're just working on uh, thinking in terms of overlap. We're blocking in what's, what's behind everything first, man. Um, I'm still up in my, in my white and the value that's between my white right here. Um, it looks like it's frozen or something. Uh, yeah, we're, still, we're still working up in that top right there. Uh, but I'm going to sneak a little towards I'm working towards that middle, but never, you can tell, you can see here, never going all the way to middle. It, it, I think it stopped frozen. Okay, we got, uh, we're dealing with some technicals, and, uh, but that's okay. We work it out. And um, you can see I'm, I'm still just blocking in, and I'm working with a value range that has a, a certain limit. I've got a little bit of a clue as to what I'm trying to, the, the values I'm looking for here. All right, boom, 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 boom. Um, if you wanna, you know, again, like cleaning anything else out, I can scrape some of that paint out and I can wipe this sucker off. Wow, we are on the fly. We're on the fly, guys, blocking it in. Um, okay, back to my light. Get that mountain in there. The, uh, the painting, again, the paint, just it naturally wants to just get dark, you know. Um, that is its inclination. But that's looking like a stormy, exciting sky. So clouds and ah. Okay, now, maybe a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit further. I'm going to start to see I'm still in middle gray. I'm going to start to push down that middle gray. Oh, about down to there. Kind of working down further down. If you, you know, once in a while you can kind of maybe flip back, back and forth between the, the image. Uh, this is middle gray here. This is where there's like a kind of a, another group of boats and horses. And uh, they're way off in the background. And so the artist has given them a little bit of atmospheric perspective uh, and, given, and they, they get lighter as they're kind of moving back into the distance. And we can just kind of suggest it. To suggest it, use your fingers, use whatever. Use all the tools at your disposal. Okay. Now, what I said, and I meant it, guys, was that everything in the foreground is going to be darker than middle gray. So what, how are we going to start the painting? Well, let's get middle gray, maybe something a little bit darker than middle gray. And I'm going to dip in my medium right now. And I'm going to get a real juicy wet. And we're right there. And, and I'm just going to lay down a, like just a big middle gray 
slightly darker than middle gray shape. Uh, here, there, that's George Washington right there as a cat. We're going to make these cats. There's another guy. Boom. This is going to be the uh, American flag goes up to about like that angle. And, uh, and uh, th these characters are all down in here. We got this other boatman over here. And uh, in the name of just laying down a single shape, this is what we want to do. Start simple and then work towards uh, the more complex. So Washington, we got this oarsman here. We got this guy, he's right about here. He's got, you know, a kind of a thin little, uh, this is not a good brush for drawing thin lines, but that's okay. There's his leg. And then let's just cover the rest of this canvas and start to get dark. And I'm just going to keep working down my dark. This water down here in the boat gets really dark eventually. But right now, we're just blocking it in, washing it in, so that we've got our separation between our foreground and our background. Have I drawn the boat yet? Does it matter? No. But the painting is already, oh shit, I'm getting paint all over your tablet here. It's OK. Um, it's, uh, yes, here we go. And that, to me, is a fabulous start. There's Washington. OK, now we'll get down to a slightly less gigantic brush. And we'll start to work out some of the more obvious shapes. Now, there's a real dark, dark shape that we could just pick right off the bat. And if that was my halfway line right about there, I'm going to say, let's start it right about here. And let's just keep refreshing our brush. And it's going to go all the way. And I'm using lots of medium, guys, all the way over. This is the boat. And don't even worry about where the bottom is. Just keep getting darker. Just keep putting, washing more paint down there. Get darker. And, and, and you know, you can always change the colors of things. You can make something lighter or whatever. You just put more paint on top of it. Right now, we're trying to think with the mentality of we're doing a lay-in. This might be how the artist started the piece. You know, like when you read Giorgio Vasari, and Vasari is talking about how Titian would lay in one of his paintings with five brush strokes and then not look at it for a month. This is what we're talking about. They would slap these on and they would be a mess. They worked out the composition before. So that in, regard, that in a certain regard gave them more confidence to uh, attack the composition. Uh, but let's start uh, making out some different shapes in here. There's a, there's a guy who's kind of triangular shaped uh, in this part of the boat. And, and we're going to kind of Picasso it, I guess, <laughs> uh, by just being, uh, this is some of Washington's, uh, he's got this dark cloak, and he stands up about that high. And uh, there's a fella behind him, and he's got another dark cloak. These dark, the dark spots of clothes are really handy to help us start to pick out uh, air elements and areas of the composition. So I'm, I'm laying down these dark darks. The, uh, and, and as long as I'm, as I'm working in this value range where uh, I'm under middle gray, essentially I can't do a wrong move. I can't. I can't make a wrong move right now. Um, we got this guy who's kind of rowing. We got another fella over here. See, I'm, again, what I'm doing is I'm not drawing lines. I'm trying to draw shapes. This is the guy who's rowing. He's rowing here. And then he's about that wide. And, uh, and he's, there's kind of a, a pile of stuff that he's sitting on in the boat. And the, the, the masses of the uh, composition are what we're sort of aiming for. He got his, he's got his hair here. There's a bunch of things going on here. There's right about at the height of Washington's knee. Here, let's, let's lay in Washington's 
knee here, and his leather legs kind of going that way. And then he's got a really dark boot. We'll put a boot in, and the boot goes down to about there. Uh, and then there's this fella who looks uh, African American. I, I, I wonder if, if he originally was, or, but that is always the character that they f argued was uh, a black uh, African American soldier fighting for the Union. Uh, we got another guy here. I'm just going to draw to overlap and mass in these shapes. He's reaching down. He's leaning this way. His face is right about there. We're starting to get to the point where we're going to want to probably refresh. There's this guy who's reaching up. There's his head. There's his arm. Um, he's in the back, so let's just get him all massed in to start with. And uh, no, he's, his leg is coming out of the boat, eh, right about over there. All right, now what's happened on my palette? The same thing that always happens. You end up running out of a color, you know? And uh, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to consolidate what's turned into basically uh, darker than middle gray pile. And I'm just going to squeeze out a bunch of new paint here for my darks. So fortunately, I kind of remembered the, you know, three parts to one part ratio that I was going for. So I can pretty easily mix up another pile of my, of my, uh, of my dark and be ready to go once again. So here we are, and I, I might get a, no, I'm not going to get a smaller brush. I'm going to stick with this larger brush for a little bit longer. Uh, we got this fella here. He's got a hat, and there's that hat going that way. We're going we're gonna to get to some of these smaller shapes quite quickly. We got to get to them quickly anyway, because we got like, what, 20 minutes? 18. Ah. Revolution was not born in a day, guys. There's him. He's got uh, kind of that thing going on. Uh, this figure over here. You know, maybe we're going to give him this other arm like that. And then this is sort of a handy uh, diagonal right there that we could start to, to lay in. How does that look? That looks all right on the, uh, on the camera. Um, no glare. No glare. That's a good move. This guy, where is he? He's reaching with his, uh, and sticking his pole in right, right about, right about there. We're using, and I recommend this, use the largest brush that you can possibly manage to let yourself get away with, okay? The largest brush that you can get away with because um, you got to go somewhere, and if you start with teensy brushes, it just, you get teensier and teensier. Um, and I was always taught, and I believe it true, that you want to start with the simple shapes. You want to start with the obvious. You want to get the big picture first. And, uh, so large brushes, the obvious values. Here's this guy's arm that's swinging this way. Um, and then there's, the, and he's kind of, you know, got his hat here. And then there's another fella over here. Now these guys have a little tiny, um, I guess you'd call it a rim light that's coming from a mysterious sunny spot off of the, uh, well, it's, it's a completely contrived image. I mean, let's just be realistic. It's a studio, it's an old master style studio painting. Um, so there's a teeny tiny rim light that's catching on the edges of, of uh, certain parts of the composition. Uh, but it so matters little at this point with uh, the, the things that you're really trying to tackle in the painting. That, Honestly, you just leave it. Like, let that be something that you're going to figure out um, 
once this painting has uh, had some time to dry and you've been able to start to lay in some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, scrape down some of the, uh, the, the texture that you have on there from, from, the, uh, from the first week and you can get some, then you can get some smaller brushes and start to refine. But you don't want to refine before you even found just what the heck's going on. Um, so that's where simple, keep it simple. And that's how we're going. So let's see, one more level smaller of a brush. And I think we'll have tackled a fairly decent lay-in of this painting. Uh, I probably want to yeah, get some more of these stronger accents and some, some possibly some subtler values. Maybe we're going to start to find the uh, a toned lay-in for their faces. These are uh, all pretty, like most of the, well, like all the founding fathers, we saw like a bunch of fair-skinned folks here. <laughs> um, and if we're gonna think in terms of what's exactly happening in this composition, the middle gray is white, we're saying. And so as long as I mix a tone that's a little bit darker than middle gray, that's what these fair fellows skin tones looks like. It's a little bit darker than white. And we have this gentleman, this fella here. I'm just really using these shapes and brush strokes to try to find these colors real quick. Um, let's do a little bit more drawing here. We get the, we're gonna get this Washington's cloak to come out a little bit further little bit further. I get the feeling like maybe his head's a little bit taller. Let's put his face here. We're gonna move his face up and then we're gonna give him his darker hat higher. And, oh, there we go. Um, I'm getting happy with it. Can use the uh, use the the dark to paint wet into wet. Right now, we're doing a lot of wet into wet shapes, and um, so uh, and unfortunately, since I know that all I'm doing is working from middle to dark, uh, I'm going to be able to scrub these shapes in move them around, change them, uh, overlap, underlap, bilap, forelap, lap dance. And we're just about ready to say that this episode's over. Don't be afraid to try and do a master copy. And by that I mean any painting, let's say, that's older than 100 years old. Which, by the way, now includes Picasso. Isn't that bizarre? It's 100 years old, over 100 years old. A um, few more little lighter shapes to uh, pick out some of their faces, and a few more darker shapes to define some more elements to the composition. But that's all painting is, folks, is patches of light and dark <laughs> in different locations. Now maybe I want to come back with some of this background and cut some, cut some of these shapes to look a little bit more like what, we're, what Washington is going with. So uh, now I'm back with a clean brush and I'm back up in my lighter lights. And I'm gonna kind of um, start, to, start to define here. Maybe, maybe I want to uh, get a little bit more uh, lighter values in, in behind uh, these fellas here. 
And maybe I want to just kind of overdo it. And then I'm going to come back with my other shapes here. So this is the guy's back. This is a slightly darker patch that's overlaying that, but also defining his back. He's got a, a, a sash that goes across, just like that. He's got uh, dark hair right here. You can see how much when you work wet into wet that the color just kind of wants to constantly be hitting its own average. You know, um, this fella also. You got his hand. That's a little spot right there where the definitely the, the lighter light is kind of evident. Um, got a neat little shape going here that's helping that guy look like he's leaning back. Then we get even darker down here. I'm going to come back to middle gray. Middle gray is pretty much what's uh, making up these foreground icebergs and things. Um, but it looks pretty white, but that's just because there's a lot of there's a lot of dark that's surrounding it. And we got another little iceberg over here, danger iceberg. Um, and then I don't know what can we do to make these look like cats? We'll put cat ears on them. No, oh, that's silly. But uh, how are we doing on time? Eight minutes. Okay, we got time. Um, God, this would be the perfect time for like calls. How do we get people to call in? That's going to be next level. Here at Dronebox Labs, because there's Dronebox Studio, then there's Dronebox Labs, which is like there's this five story underground facility, and they actually, Elon Musk has built a tunnel from SpaceX to the lab here, and they're working on all kinds of ways to get you to have a more and more interactive experience with your entertainment. To the point where it's like, we'll just be in your room, and you'll be like, would you please leave? And we won't leave. We're not leaving. Um, so I guess just let's just, let's just Futs around here and start to get littler and littler shapes and, and define stuff with uh, just a little bit increasing detail, smaller shapes. Ah, uh, you know, um, one thing that's again deceptive about doing a painting show is um, I don't really talk to myself when I'm painting, you know? And there's a lot of uh, silence. Uh, uh, for better or worse, uh, painters, they've sort of slipped into painting because they are kind of loners, in a sense. and. Um, and they, they like to work and, 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 um, by themselves, at least to modern contemporary painters. Not all of them. You know, back in the day, uh, if you ran a studio, man, you were like, it was more like running a movie studio, I think, in a smaller sense, if you think about the old master studios. Um, it was like a full production. They had to make paint. And, and, uh, and there was a division of labor to everything. And, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, we don't have that so much now. So let's, uh, let's draw this other little uh, oar in here. Because these oars help to kind of define the composition in a nice way. We've got another. Uh, iceberg right here and it's got you know like shadow side and shards and hard edges and whatnot and here's our little ore he's jamming into it 
make sure we don't pop the boat. And I'm getting happy with it because I'm feeling like it's looking progress, not perfection, is definitely an axiom that you could always apply towards painting. You know, there is no wrong move. That's what I want you guys to, to come away with right now. Um, as we've got, what, two minutes left? We've got five minutes left. No wrong moves. This is not anything. Everything is the right move. And if you think you did a wrong move, um, think of it as just a future right move that happened at the wrong time. Does that make sense? No. Um, just don't worry. Bite off more than you can chew. Be uncomfortable because in the end of the day, there's nothing to be uncomfortable about. Um, enjoy the mess. Don't try to control the paint all the time. It does interesting things on its own if you let it. Uh, so those are all fun things to, to keep in mind. Look, I'm going to get this one little mountain here, and I'm just going to, oh, look, I went too far. Uh, oh, oh I, I crossed in front of that guy. Did I just ruin it? No, because then look. I can go, oh, I'm going to paint that back in front of that. Oh, I'm going to paint his face right like that. Oh, I'm going to put that dark right around his hat again. Hey, wait, he's back. Oh, I'm going to put a little bit more uh, shadow right there. And then I'll put his arm back. And all of a sudden, we got that mountain nicely going behind him. And we didn't have to, we cut right in front. So we move, we move things. We have no fear. These are not, this painting is not the times that try men's souls. This is the painting, this is the time that makes you have no fear. Uh, now with the wet and the wet, we're gonna we're gonna run into a diminishing ability to kind of create hard edges, and but that's another understanding that comes with painting, is recognizing when to stop. Now, we know when to stop on this show. It's in two minutes, because we're out of time after two minutes. But you have to learn when to stop in your own painting. And that's a tricky thing because you can, don't worry about it, but you can kill it. But don't worry about it because it's not really killed. But you can kill it, but don't worry about it. But you can, but don't worry about it. Because it'll, it'll stop, uh, I'll stop. It'll, it, it, it's again, just a matter of it's not ruined, it's just not there yet. So there we go. I'm happy with it. And I think we got perfect timing once again. Uh, there you go, guys. Your own revolution on canvas. The start of Washington crossing the Delaware. Uh, this has been the third episode of Paint with Alex. And I want to thank everyone here. I want to thank my producer, Dulcinea. And I want to thank uh, everyone here at Dronebox for uh, putting up with me. And if you're watching, oh my god, thank you for watching. One of these cameras is the right one. Yeah, because we had to do a switch up in the middle. Let's, uh, let's call it a day. And um, I will, I'll slide whistle us out. <laughs>